Hi, Cynthia Allen here. We're on the last day of the Feldenkrais Awareness Summit. We're getting ready to do our second talk in the track of Beyond Diagnosis. But first, I just want to remind you to look around on the platform and start corresponding in the chat and have a conversation there with each other, get to know each other. And then um, we will be using that chat to fold into the panel discussion that will be held at 1.15 Eastern Daylight Time today. Our guest today is Dr. Pradeep Chopra. He's a pain management specialist in Providence, Rhode Island, where he lives with his wife. He has uh, done his residency in anesthesia and critical care and his fellowship in pain medicine for all at Harvard Medical School. He's an assistant professor at Brown Medical School, and he works full time as a pain medicine specialist. I'm very pleased to say he's very well published on these uh, topics, and um, I got in touch with him because Lavinia Planca, a client of hers, I believe is also a patient of his, and said, "Do you know about this?" this gentleman and I'm very interested particularly in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and so when Lavinia brought it up uh, and I contacted Dr. Chopra and he agreed to talk with us today I was very pleased for that. Hi Dr. Chopra. Thank you uh, Cynthia thank you for that introduction and I'm just going to say a couple more things here so Dr. Chopra is going to be leading us on a journey of the kind of clinical background of chronic regional pain syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And then we're going to come back and talk a little bit about the Feldenkrais uh, connection to that. But I do think, even though we normally are not a clinical-based group, I think Dr. Chopra is going to give us some information that if you um, are a practitioner, could be really helpful to know because these uh, he's going to show us these conditions are not really well understood uh, by a lot of people. So knowledge is good. Go Thank ahead. you, Cynthia. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. And it truly is a pleasure and an honor uh, to be invited uh, to speak to you. And I think this is really an exciting opportunity for, uh, for us, for the physicians to understand uh, the magic of Feldenkrais and how we can use that. It's, uh, it's obviously a very underutilized uh, modality. And, it really helps, uh, I think it'll help a lot in the, within the medical field and also the patients who are not aware of it uh, and how it can be used to treat not just um, some of these complex regional pain syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but in general chronic pain conditions with joint issues and muscle issues. Um, so with this, I, I can start my, my slides. Yes, sir, please do. Okay. Ready? Start? Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's, it's a, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about complex regional pain syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome uh, beyond diagnosis. So how do you, so the, the, the goal of this presentation is to teach you about how to, um, how, just it's, it's like putting a bug in your head. So if you see a patient with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, how do you uh, go about sort of just in your own mind, uh, confirming that and you know, sort of putting the patient on the right track um, as to what's going on with them. I also want you to understand uh, complex regional pain syndrome. <clears throat> uh, by way of introduction, uh, I have no um, actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. Uh, I, we're not gonna talk about medications much, but they may, if there is any, it'll be off label. And again, this is not meant to replace um, medical advice. <clears throat> uh, we've already gone, uh, Cynthia's already done my introduction, so we can go straight to the presentation. Uh, I'm gonna start with complex regional pain syndrome, also known as CRPS. Um, it used to be formally known as um, RSD. Uh, I know this is a kind of a busy slide, but I just want to sort of look at the, the highlighted sections, um, it's number one, it's a continuing pain. It's not, um, it doesn't, it's, it's, this pain never goes down to zero or 10. Um, so one of the key questions we always ask these patients, does your pain ever go down to zero? And if it does, then it's likely, it's most likely not CRPS, it's something else. 
Uh, they do have spontaneous flare-ups. Uh, it's obviously the, the, the predominant symptom in these patients is pain, and it's disproportionate to the time or degree of the course. So if somebody had a fracture of their arm and they're still, it's been a year, two years, three years, and they still continue to have severe and excruciating pain, that should trigger thoughts of CRPS. They also have abnormal, other, other abnormalities like which, which are related to their sensory and motor functioning, which we'll get into, into that a little later. Uh, and then they, the, the, the condition can actually have a variable progression over time. It, in some cases, it gets to be worse and worse, and in some cases, it just plateaus out. And there have been also cases where it has gone into remission. Mm -hmm. uh, officially, there are three types of CRPS. Uh, there's CRPS-1, formerly known as reflex sympathetic dystrophy, or RSD. And then there's CRPS type 2, formerly known as causalgia. And then there's something called CRPS NOS, not otherwise specified, which, um, which means that the patient kind of meets the criteria of CRPS, but not quite. Um, it, it might be somebody who's in the healing stages or has become so chronic that it's not meeting the criteria, but um, we don't, in practice, we just use, uh, in reality, in practice, we just use the two types, CRPS1 and 2. The difference between CRPS1 is that it's, in CRPS1, it's a non-specific nerve damage. So the entire limb is affected. Uh, there's no specific nerve that's been affected. Uh, they have general diffuse pain to that limb or limbs. Um, in CRPS type 2, there is a very specific nerve damage. And oftentimes you'll see that they had uh, some sort of a trauma or a wound injury that that sort of that's damaged their nerve and they ended up uh, having CRPS type 2. And this was actually how it was first initially diagnosed in World War I when there were soldiers coming in with bullet injuries to their arm and they had pain shooting on their arm and that was initially recognized to be CRPS. Um, and it was actually CRPS type 2. Uh, the symptoms and signs are almost the same. Uh, the difference lies in some of the treatments. Um, <clears throat> The common causes of CRPS is usually after a trauma, it's usually after a fracture uh, and immobilization. One of the things that I just want to remind you is that if a patient has has a history of or has comes in and says that you know they have this their limb is in a is in a cast and they're still having severe pain, uh, it should trigger thoughts of CRPS. Uh, it can happen after a simple sprain. Needle stick injuries are very common. Uh, they can have that. Uh, in some cases, it can be from prolonged immobilization or brain injury. Uh, CRPS from brain injury is a different, uh, it's a whole different condition called central pain syndrome. Uh, some of the terminology that's used in, CR in describing CRPS is hyperesthesia, which is uh, really just a weird sensation to touch. Uh, oftentimes, this creepy crawly sensation, not really pain, but just a bad, yucky sensation. Um, allodynia is pain to soft touch. Um, they will not let you touch. They will not let you even come near that limb. Dystonia is a movement disorder in which these muscles contract and they sort of just tighten up. Uh, what it is not, it is an amplified pain syndrome. Uh, it's often referred to as amplified pain. Sometimes some practitioners call it amplified pain syndrome. The reason I brought this up is because if a patient comes into you, and a client comes and says, hey, I have been diagnosed with amplified pain syndrome. Uh, think of CRPS. It's really just another uh, name for uh, CRPS. <clears throat> the diagnosis of CRPS um, is based on a, a very definitive criteria. And the criteria, one of them is a temperature difference. Um, officially, they say a temperature difference of one degree is enough between the affected and the unaffected side. In reality, we see a much higher difference. Um, and it's both subjective and objective. So patients might tell you, hey, my affected side is really warmer or it's really colder than the, other, than the normal side. Uh, <clears throat> even if they have CRPS on both sides, you can oftentimes see a temperature difference. Um, see, the problem lies in when you have it in the axial skeleton, if it's in the torso, abdomen, or chest wall, then uh, it's hard to get a temperature difference. 
But uh, you can also see that maybe the upper abdomen to the lower abdomen, there's a temperature difference. Uh, color difference is, uh, uh, is very obvious. You can see the limb looks different. And uh, again, later on, you'll see some pictures. Uh, that limb might look red, blue, green, uh, gray, sorry, not green. Um, and uh, the temperature, com the, the color difference comes and goes. Uh, we, we tell our patients to take pictures of both limbs uh, uh, when they see a color difference so that, and you can look at them in, in the office and see if there are the color difference. <clears throat> Signs and symptoms, uh, the pain usually starts in the limb, uh, but it can start in any part of the body. It is a constant pain, uh, which, which with spontaneous exacerbations, temperature difference, color difference, they have swelling. Swelling is more common in the acute stages. Uh, often in the chronic stages, you may not see swelling. Um, again, I'll show that, I'll show you some pictures later on. Uh, what's important is that the pain is usually in a larger area than the primary injury. So if somebody sustained a foot injury, uh, right foot injury, the pain is, is, is maybe in the entire leg uh, or even on the other opposite leg also. Um, they, they may have increased sweating. Um, it's not common, but they do have increased sweating. It is actually in the diagnostic criteria. Uh, they can have uh, a very, very uncomfortable to touch. Uh, they, it's pain or very uncomfortable to touch. They may have... Nail growth changes, and I'll show you some pictures. Uh, the nails are broke, they, they are brittle, they grow faster, they are distorted, ridged. Hair growth changes, uh, you'll see some hair growth. It may be darker, or it may, it may say less hair also. Um, in the acute phase, in the initial stages, the skin might be shiny and thin. Uh, they can have blisters, and they can vary anywhere from pinpoint blisters, uh, lesions to blisters, and again, increased sweating. This, uh, this over here, you can see uh, swelling, uh, swelling in the in the left ankle. You can see this marks on the socks, the elastic. You can see a clear color difference between the two uh, sides. Uh, in this picture, you can again see swelling over the ankle. You see, you can't see the tendons, uh, and so that's an indication that there's swelling over there. Uh, you can see the nails, how they've uh, how they're broken off. They're brittle. They're ridged. Uh, they're cracked. Uh, these are some of the signs. This is another example of swelling. Uh, you can see the swelling on the right, uh, over the right wrist. Uh, you don't see the, the tendons and the bones. Uh, and then of course, marked color change. Uh, these are some of the samples you'll see. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a busy slide, uh, so I don't really want to dwell on it too much, but this is the diagnostic criteria as set by the uh, by an international consensus, consensus uh, in, in 2004, uh, commonly known as a Budapest criteria. On the left-hand side, you see the symptoms. And on the right-hand side, you see the signs. Symptoms are what the patient presents with. Signs are what you see. And again, uh, the patient must have at least uh, one symptom in three of the four categories, and then must have one sign present in uh, at the time of evaluation in two or more of the following categories. And those are some, those, these are, I've already explained these to you briefly. Uh, so it's important to understand that the diagnosis of CRPS is clinical. And uh, I also want to point out that in medicine, uh, almost 80% of the conditions that we diagnose are clinical. They are not, there are no tests for it. For example, headaches or depression or schizophrenia. Uh, all of these conditions are clinical diagnosis. There are no MRIs and X-rays and blood tests to define them. And it's the same with CRPS. Uh, fortunately with CRPS, we have a very clear criteria that needs to be uh, identified. Uh, oftentimes uh, you'll come across, uh, you know, imaging techniques, people will say, oh, hey, uh, the X-ray was normal, the MRI is normal. None of these are are a diagnostic for CRPS, nothing, either the blood tests or any uh, response to nerve blocks, uh, EMGs, none of these are diagnostic of CRPS other than the criteria that I just mentioned. The only reason you may want these tests done or a, or a physician may want these tests done is to rule out any other condition. <clears throat> uh, CRPS does spread uh, and not always, especially CRPS type one may spread. Uh, CRPS two generally does not spread. 
And we'll talk a little bit about the reasons why it spreads. Uh, this is usually as a result of uh, central sensitization, which, which, is, which is a phenomenon I really want to discuss today uh, because that explains a lot of the pain, almost all chronic pain conditions. And it, decreasing central sensitization is key to curing, helping these patients. Uh, CRPS is not a psychological disorder. It's not in your head. And this was clearly stated by the International Association for the Study of Pain when they came up with the Budapest criteria and they said, we just want to be clear that this is not a psychological disorder. This is an organic condition uh, and should not be treated as a purely psychiatric condition. <clears throat> so how do you know if you have CRPS? Uh, the best thing is to talk to a, a specialist who actually uh, has experience in treating CRPS. It's not like someone saying, hey, I don't treat CRPS, I don't know what it is, but I think that you have, uh, to me it looks like you have CRPS. Um, again, the criteria, um, the criteria is very straightforward on that. Now, <clears throat> by definition, CRPS does not have a known cause. That was the initial criteria was when the International Association for Study for Pain said, came out with, they said that you really have to rule out everything before you can call it CRPS, but that was in 2004. And now over the years, we've come to realize that some of these patients may actually have a cause for CRPS. Just to give you an example, autoimmune conditions can cause symptoms of CRPS and they may respond to it, or respond to treatment of their autoimmune dysfunction. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this is, um, so, in the, uh, so the difference between early and chronic stages is that uh, the temperature difference is much more obvious in the early stages, and then you may not see this temperature difference as the condition progresses. Uh, same thing with the color difference. Swelling is very random. Again, it does not imply, patients often will com complain to you saying like, hey, my hand is really swollen. That means my condition is getting worse. That's not the case. Swelling has nothing to do with the severity of the condition. <clears throat> So you can always reassure them. Uh, this is another example of a color difference I wanted to show you. This is um, increased hair growth. So you can see on the left side within that circle, um, you can see uh, a tuft of hair. It's dark, it's, it's a bushy hair growth on his. Uh, this is actually a 14 year old kid uh, who had this uh, CRPS on his left leg, mostly around the knee. Uh, Again, uh, I apologize, this slide is a, re uh, the next two slides are a repeat, sorry. Uh, I don't, I can't, I don't want to go too much into details of uh, treatment of CRPS, uh, but I'll just touch on a few basic things. Uh, this, the thing to do is, if you suspect CRPS, the treatment should start immediately. And the reason to start these, this treatment immediately is to <coughs> avoid something called central sensitization, avoid the nervous system from becoming oversensitized. It should be evaluated by a physician who's very familiar with it. Um, and of course, it has to have a multidisciplinary approach. So step A is to confirm if the patient actually has CRPS. So we, we've talked about the criteria. Uh, if they meet the criteria, then they do have CRPS. Um, it's, it shouldn't be like, okay, you know, hey, you have a fracture. I, you had a fracture. I don't know what the reason is why you still have pain. It's probably CRPS. It sends them down into, a, into the wrong, uh, it sends them into a wrong direction uh, looking for treatments of CRPS, whereas it could be something completely different. Uh, the next thing is to determine if it's CRPS1 or CRPS2, which means that in CRPS1, we really don't know. It's a diffuse kind of a pain. There's no specific nerve that's damaged um, and in CRPS2 there's a very specific nerve damage and the 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 treatment varies uh, quite a bit between the two. Some of the commonly used medicines are uh, gabapentin, uh, something called pregabalin, melnaciprine, am amitriptyline, nortriptyline, uh, duloxetine. Um, that's Symbolta has become much more common nowadays, uh, duloxetine in the treatment of um, chronic pain conditions. Uh, there are way too many side effects, uh, so I personally don't like it. Uh, some of the other drugs that are used are acetaminophen, uh, NSAIDs, uh, 
uh, some people do try steroids uh, in the acute phase, and it can actually make a difference. Uh, <clears throat> topical creams are not really helpful because this condition is not limited to the limb. It is more limited to the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. So putting anything on the limb is really not going to make a big difference. Uh, one of the things that is recommended in the medical literature is desensitization. Uh, and desensitization is the idea that, oh, you know, patient, I have CRPS in my left hand, and so I'm trying to, I'll try not to use it. So I have some sort of a kinesiophobia. And so they, and it's, it's, it's more like a psychological issue. And so we, they, it's like a fear of moving your limb or fear of touching your limb. So you know how you have fear of spiders and so they put you in a room with spiders. I have no idea why they do that, but they put you in a room with spiders. Uh, so this the is- The I've never agreed with either. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm terrified of spiders. Okay, that's fine. Don't, don't, don't put me in a room with spiders or don't put me on a plane if I'm afraid of flying. But that's not gonna cure my phobia of flying or cure my phobia of uh, spiders. But that's the principle that they use in this is, oh, um, you're afraid of your hand being touched. So let's touch it even more or let's put it in a rice bowl or rub it with a piece of cloth. Uh, it really worsens these patients' condition. And so this whole idea of desensitization has no medical or no pathological or physiological basis to it other than a, just a psychiatric basis to it. And this is not, as I said, this is not a behavioral condition. This is not a psychiatric condition. Um, <clears throat> Some, one of the things about, uh, just a brief one, I, a single slide on, ch on CRPS in children. Uh, for some reason, uh, uh, the, the treatment for CRPS in children is a little different in adults. Uh, I, don't, I don't follow this philosophy. The idea behind CRPS, treating CRPS in children is to put them into boot camp physical therapy. I mean, just do tons of desensitization make them do boot camp uh, uh, exercises, horrible, gruesome exercises, and somehow they'll get better. And if they don't get better, then it's, it's, it, there's, there's behavioral. Uh, this same standard does not apply to adults uh, for some reason. And so I don't, I, don't, um, I don't agree with this philosophy. Uh, so children need to be treated the same way as adults are treated when it comes to treating CRPS. Uh, Physical uh, therapy modalities are extremely important, as we all know. Um, it's important to move the limb as much as possible uh, to avoid any atrophy or contractures. Um, it is difficult, obviously, if, you're, if your limb hurts and you don't want to move it. If your leg hurts, you don't want to walk on it. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want the muscles to atrophy. You don't want to get, um, you don't want to rewire. We don't want to re have these patients rewire their brain to to ignore that movement. Um, and <clears throat> so the whole philosophy of no pain, no gain does not apply over here. Uh, one, of the, one of the group, so, so they came up, uh, there's a group from a uh, group of neuro, uh, surgeon, neuro, neurologists and neuro rehab physicians from Australia came up with this philosophy of graded motor imagery. And uh, in graded motor imagery, it's in two parts, it's in three parts, I'm sorry. Uh, in the first part, what they do is they uh, teach you to learn to discriminate between left and right sides. And, and, and I'll get into this a little bit later on. One of the things that happens in CRPS is they have uh, their, their brain structures, the, 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 their brains get rewired. And so they lose their ability to discriminate between left and right. Because, you know, if I have pain, if I have CRPS in my left hand, my brain tends to neglect my left side. And so this is to get back that sensation of recognizing your um, affected side. And so it's called, the first section is called left and right discrimination. There's, they have an app, they have a book, they basically get you through slides rapidly and you have to keep pinpointing which is left and right. Uh, they'll show you a left hand and then they'll show you a right hand and then they'll show you a left leg, left, right. And so you keep have to quickly recognize them. And um, it's, it's actually, uh, pretty interesting, and uh, um, I flunked it. Uh, so, <laughs> explicit. <laughs> you know, How did you flunk it? <laughs> I flunked it. I was horrified. Uh, anyway, so 
the the second stage is uh, in this in this philosophy is that 25% of our brain is made up of what are called mirror neurons so <clears throat> these mirror neurons start to fire even when you think of think of moving say for example i decide to pick up a cup uh, i haven't done anything i'm just still staring at the cup i haven't done anything right away 25% of my mirror neurons uh, my brain will start to fire uh, getting me so as to get me ready to uh, pick up that cup and it's the same thing uh, when you watch someone say you watch somebody running uh, 25% of your mirror neurons or motor neurons start to fire uh, so imagining movements before actually moving use the same neurons that you would use when you actually move so you already 25 of the person of those neurons that were going to activate my right arm right hand to pick up the cup have already started firing even before i even even if i even before i head towards the cup uh, so it looks a little like that <clears throat> the third stage is uh, the the third stage is called mirror therapy and in this what they do is uh, they uh, you hide your affected side in this picture you can see this lady is hiding her left hand that's the affected side behind the mirror so she can't see it so she's actually looking into the mirror and she sees two hands and she sees a real right hand uh, and then she sees a mirror image of her right hand in the mirror uh, which the brain confuses as your left hand and this is to again encourage uh, patient the brain to rewire itself to thinking that to avoid that neglect that they get um, and I, I personally think that feldenkrais has a big role in this part and cynthia you can um, <clears throat> tell us a little bit more about that so these are the three stages you have the left right discrimination which was using that app and the pictures and the explicit motor imagery is when you start to imagine that you're starting to move or you watch someone move and that helps 25 percent of your neurons to move and then finally you have mirror therapy <clears throat> one of the mistakes that's happening now is that uh, a lot of <clears throat> a lot of places they jump straight to mirror therapy which is stage three you can't go to stage three unless you have gone through stage one and two first. So this was briefly about uh, complex regional pain syndrome. And uh, before I get into Ellis Danlos syndrome, I just want to summarize it. The diagnosis of CRPS is very, very straightforward. You have to meet A, B, C, D criteria, uh, differentiate between CRPS one and two. One of the issues that these people have is uh, an immense sense of kinesiophobia. They're afraid to use that arm, uh, and rightfully so, because it's painful. Um, and eventually the brain starts to neglect that side of the, of the brain, of that, uh, the affected side, it begins to neglect it. And it just starts to escalate into a worsening pain uh, condition. <clears throat> um, let's talk about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. In this, Ellis Danlos syndrome is uh, about connective tissue. And in these patients, connective tissue, uh, very simply put, connective tissue in these patients is softer than in other people. Um, it's not a disease. It's, not, it's just a form of the human body, just like you have tall people, short people, black people, white people. They all have their own set of medical conditions. Patients with Ellis Danlos syndrome have softer connective tissue. So they have their own set of medical conditions as compared to somebody who does not have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, but I, for those of you who are practitioners, just make sure that patients understand that, that this is not a uh, condition, that this is not a disease that they have to live with, they were born with and they have to live with. It's just a form. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a, a far more complex condition that we initially thought it to be. Um, at first, we had thought it is just, oh, it's just a joint issue. These patients have um, very hypermobile joints and that's all it is. But over the last decade, we've come to realize that it is a lot more than that. And these are the things that you'll see in, excuse me, in patients with <clears throat> Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, uh, they may have an autoimmune dysfunction. They can have craniocervical instability joint instability, uh, something called POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Uh, they can have a tethered cord syndrome, this, their spinal cords are tethered. They can have mast cell activation syndrome. And I'll kind of briefly touch on some of the more important ones. Mast cell activation syndrome is 
uh, is a growing uh, issue right now. Patients are beginning to develop sensitivities to different chemicals, foods, drugs, all sorts of issues. Um, their immune system goes, is going, it goes haywire. Uh, they have abdominal pain and then they have carry malformation, which is essentially herniation of the, of the brain through the foramen magnum or the hole in the skull. So a patient with EDS can have any or some or all of these conditions. And it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's for us uh, to be able to differentiate like what are, these, what are the issues and how do we, in order to get them better, we really need to cover all of these or whatever these patients have. So if somebody, somebody comes in with say joint instability and mast cell activation syndrome, we really have to cover treat their mast cell and the joint instability to get them functional. And the idea behind treatment of pain, I just want to make mention is, is to, it's, it's not as much as bringing the pain down, it's about being functional. Um, I know for sure that if I close my eyes and think of all the body parts that hurt, I'll probably come up with 20 of them. But that didn't stop me from going to work this morning. And <clears throat> so I'm functional, but the day when, I, when this pain or any one of these pains becomes so bad that I can't function, that's when I start to worry and I need to, we need to fix that. So I call this being more functional rather than worrying about is your pain skill, you know, zero to 10 or is it five? It, that makes no sense to me. And it really doesn't. I mean, I could, there are people out there who have nine or 10 pain are still functional. And then there are people who have four out of 10 pain and just can't function. Uh, it's not because they are, these people with four or 10 patients, a pain are, are, are wimpy. It's because it's their grading is different. They don't understand. I don't know what 10 or 10 pain means. Um, so that's, that's the way to look at it is to, so what I do is I don't ask them their number. I say like, um, there, has it affected your functioning and how much has it affected your functioning? And that's my, my goal or my criteria for finding out how badly they're affected. So in EDS, there are three things to know. Uh, like I said, it's not a disease. Uh, they have soft connective tissues. So everything in the human body is connected. So you have the muscles, ligaments, skin, bones, joints, they're all connected to each other. And they're all connected. The tissue that connects them is called connective tissue, obviously, because it connects everything. So <clears throat> connective tissue in these patients is softer. It's more elastic. Um, they have poor joint position sense, or also known as proprioception. Um, and that's something that you will, you, these, it's not particular to just EDS. Uh, toddlers have it, they have not yet developed their joint position sense, so they tend to fall as they learn how to walk. The elderly, they tend to uh, lose their joint position sense. That's one of the reasons why they fall a lot is because they are not, they're not, and I'll get into proprioception into greater detail, but. It's a, it's a normal physiological phenomenon that happens. Uh, patients who have got joint replacement surgeries, um, they don't have joint, great joint position sense. Um, and then they come up with also have, patients with EDS have coexisting conditions as I mentioned uh, previously. <clears throat> so how common or how rare is this condition? We don't really know for sure. And the reason we don't know is because we are missing these diagnoses. Uh, but to give you an example, rheumatoid arthritis is 41 in 100,000. Crohn's disease is 10 in 100,000. And from a very conservative measure, we know that Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is 10 in 100,000. Now, everybody knows Crohn's disease. Uh, everybody knows rheumatoid arthritis. But when you mention Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and they just look at you like, huh, what? So <clears throat> we think the presumed frequency is about 1% in the general population. Uh, that number is way lower than what, what we really think it is, uh, but we haven't been able to do it. We, haven't, we don't have accurate statistics because we are missing these diagnoses. So for those who are out there in practice who are treating patients, um, I can assure you that you have already seen patients with EDS and you are definitely going to see patients with EDS. And I'm going to teach you today how to diagnose these people, how to find out if they have it or not. So moving on to types of EDS, um, there are 13 subtypes of EDS and I'm not gonna, most of them are all rare 
um, types of EDS. They, uh, the common ones are classic EDS, um, the classical type EDS, um, that's written as small c, capital EDS. And then there's the hypermobile or the hypermobility EDS, which is uh, the commonest kind. <clears throat> and then you have the vascular EDS, which is written as a small v EDS. And then you have uh, another 10 different subtypes, which are extremely rare. I mean, when I say rare, they're as rare as like seeing uh, seven patients, seven people in the entire world, uh, as rare as that. <clears throat> so how do you diagnose EDS? It's purely clinical. Uh, it's not a genetic test. Uh, so when a patient comes in and you suspect the patient has EDS, uh, the hypermobile, I'm just gonna go back, uh, of these 13 subtypes, the hypermobile type does not have a, we don't know the genetic mutation in this case. Uh, we know what the genetic mutation in classical type is, we know the vascular type and all the other subtypes, except the hypermobile type, we don't have it. And that is the commonest kind of EDS we have. So relying on a genetic testing is not, is not a good idea. Um, it's a clinical diagnosis. I call it the nine second test. <clears throat> The nine second test is the Byton score. Um, in the Byton score, um, you have the patient uh, flex their wrist and have them push their thumb and they should be able to touch the forearm. And if they can touch the forearm, that's considered as one. So one on the right and one on the left, which is one plus one, two. Um, the second one is you have them place their hand flat on the, on the table and pull up their pinky. And if it's greater than 90 degrees, that's considered another one. So another one on the right, one on the left, so that's one, four. So the thumb is two and the pinky fingers is two, that's four. Um, what I do is I look at for hyperextension. So you have them uh, bring their arm out like they're like trying to wave at someone, bring like, are they asking for something? And you can clearly see, um, how the, the elbow is hyperextended. And that's again, one plus one is another six. Um, for the knee joint, I have them, I, I look, at them, look at them from the side view and I sort of have them push their knees back or you can even have them bend their waist a little bit, pushing their knees back and you can clearly see hyperextension in these cases. Uh, look for, Look for the skin fold over here. See this little skin fold that shows up? That'll give you an idea that this is hyperextending over here. Um, <clears throat> and then the final one is they can bend over and touch the ground flat with their hands, not just the, tip finger, the tips of their fingers, but flat. And that's the ninth one. Uh, <clears throat> generally, if I cross six or seven, I don't go on to this. This I think is a pretty um, scary, measure to do uh, to some in somebody with chronic pain. So I'll generally, if I go up to five or six, I'll stop and I'll know that their Byton score is positive. So these are the nine. Uh, just, I'm gonna quickly recap. Um, the thumb touching the forearm is one and one. Uh, pinky finger greater than 90 degrees is one and one. Elbows on each side, hyperextended is one and one. Knees again, one and one. So that's a total of eight. And the ninth one is touching the floor with the flat of your hand. So, in, in 2017, uh, they were able to um, actually give us a grading on this. Uh, children and adolescents greater than six or nine or equal to six or nine is positive. People over the age of 50 years greater than five or nine, uh, up to 50 years, five or nine, and then greater than 50 years is uh, four or nine. Uh, that gives you an idea these patients are hypermobile or not. There are other signs also to look for. Uh, for example, if you see a child sitting in a W position, that's another sign that gives you, that should trigger an idea. And they love sitting in this position because it stretches their muscles. Uh, and this is another idea. They'll give you an idea. Okay, so this, you know, let's test this patient for um, the, do the Byton score. Uh, they can, what is called the reverse namaste sign. Uh, <clears throat> They have scarring, which is paper thin, also known as cigarette paper scar. 
you can see that how it's really, really thin in the middle. Uh, it's like paper. They might either have paper thin scar or they might have the opposite. They might have thickened scar, which is called a hypertrophic scar. Uh, but this is more common, especially in the classical type, you'll see this a lot. Uh, this is again an example of a weak scar. So not all scars look like this. Sometimes you'll see this. And they scar very easily. I mean, I've, I've seen scars from mosquito bites. Uh, I've seen scars from IVs they've started. And the, if they get a scar, it's there for life. And you can see how wide these scars are. So this is, this is the quick and easy way to diagnose or even suspect the patient has EDS. The full diagnosis is a little more elaborate, um, but these, 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 well, if you see somebody with these kind of th features, suspect hypermobility or suspect um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and then you can put them on the right path. That, that's the whole idea. I'm gonna briefly touch on uh, pain in EDS by body regions. <clears throat> Headaches is very common in patients with um, EDS. It's extremely common. Uh, and there are actually, I've just listed nine of them, but uh, there are actually 25 different reasons. I've, I've taken out the, the rare ones. Migraines are common. Now, uh, just as a point, um, you're likely to, EDS is common in both boys and girls. Uh, there's no difference in the incidence except that patients with, uh, girls present with more symptoms than boys do. Um, but the incidence is pretty much the same. And I don't know if migraines are common because of the EDS or because they're girls, because migraines are more common in women. Um, they do have carry malformation, which is another reason for headaches. These patients will have, tend to have uh, balance problems. They tend to have, uh, uh, they, they have posture problems. Uh, it's basically herniation of the brain through the skull. Cervicogenic headaches is muscle spasms that connect to the head. Temporomandibular joint is these joints are very loose. They tend to grind. They tend to dislocate these joints. They have postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which I'll get into later on. They may have CSF leak, spontaneous CSF leak. That's the fluid that the brain and the spinal cord floats in. Um, it's a closed chamber. It shouldn't be leaking out. Sometimes they develop um, a leak and that ends, results in headaches. These headaches usually get worse when they stand. They almost go away when they lie down. They may have instability of the head and neck, so they present with craniocervical instability. And in some cases, they also have pressure, uh, increased pressure in their head, which causes uh, headaches in these patients. Um, I'm just gonna to touch on one of these, uh, that is craniocervical instability. They'll tell you that, you know, my head feels too heavy to hold up. Now, Oftentimes patients don't say that because they're born with that. So they don't know that it's not supposed to be like that. So sometimes you can ask them like, hey, does your head feel too heavy to hold up? And invariably they'll tell you it's true. A lot of it has to do with posture. So they have a chin poking forward posture. Um, and <clears throat> over here you can, what, what happens in these patients is uh, they, they, they have different reasons for having this posture. Um, poking forward is they have loose muscles in their neck. Uh, they have uh, blurry vision, which again causes some of these, uh, makes them focus forward. And then we also of course, spend a lot of time on our computers and cell phones, which we stick our heads out. <clears throat> the problem with this is that if the head and the neck is in a normal neutral position, the weight of the head, the pressure of the head and neck on the spine is about 10 to 11 pounds, that's the equivalent of a bowling ball. If it moves forward by an inch, the pressure now becomes 20 pounds, it almost doubles. And if you stick your head forward by two inches, it becomes 30 pounds. And that's a lot of pressure. And if you were to check and see, a forward, chin poking forward position about one inch to two inches, extremely common, it's not that unusual to see that. Even with people with EDS, have they, we have a chin poking forward position. Uh, but we don't see those symptoms as much because in EDS, because of their low joint laxity, they present with more symptoms. <clears throat> um, so before looking for all the other fancy causes, look for this. Um, again, chin poking forward position can cause 
uh, neck pain. It can even cause postural changes to their back, down to their hips, to their knees, and into their, um, into their ankles. One of the reasons they have this is because of blurry vision uh, that comes and goes. They have dizziness from parts. They have loose ligaments in their spine. Uh, they have instability of their head and neck. Uh, this, I just, this is one thing that I threw in. Um, I have them put their finger in front of their uh, chin and have them push back. And they'll give them an idea of how much their chin is poking forward. Uh, use a large monitor, uh, manage their parts, their instability. So, and that brings me to spinal instability. That, that again is, I think, very relevant in, 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 in your field, in Feldenkrais, because a lot of these patients have spinal instability. The spine is made up of, uh, you know, lots of joints. They're all held together by ligaments and muscles. And in these patients, the ligaments and muscles are elastic, they're loose. And so they tend to, um, have instability when they do have that the muscles so if you if your spine is unstable unstable then the muscles around the spine will then spasm up uh, to tighten the spine and so as a result they now have muscle pain <clears throat> uh, in the thoracic region there is a they also have the additional ribs that meet the spine so each rib meets the spine where it meets the spine in the back there are three joints and so any of those joints become loose. And very often these patients will complain of sharp pain in their back. Uh, too much, they, they sort of, it catches their breath. Uh, they have loose joints in their lower back, the sacral leg joint or their side joint, which is part of the pelvis. Uh, again, the, this is very common. And like I said, SI joint, sorry, ED, patient, women present with more symptoms of, S, of EDS and SI joints uh, pain, SI joint pain is more common in women. And so it's a double whammy in these patients. Um, it can be from uneven posture or in the way they stand, um, which tilts their pelvis. And once their pelvis is tilted, that, dis that puts their SI joint out of whack. So you can see the amount of muscles uh, in the back that form this. So if these muscles, this, all these muscles go into a spasm in order to stabilize the spine, that's, a, that's what these patients often present with. Rib pain is uh, uh, very common. These patients present with what is called air hunger. And they'll, they'll, when you ask them, they'll tell you that they sigh a lot. Um, and they, they, they sort of, like, it's almost like they're not getting enough of a breath in. They also have pain from their ribs. And, uh, and when you test them, everything is normal. Their heart and lungs are, everything is normal. What happens in these patients is um, that the ribs move up and down. Um, there are approximately 10 ribs on each side that move in, in harmony up and down all together. And as they move up and down, the brain then senses the position of these ribs and then initiates inhalation or exhalation. The problem is that if, 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 if these are the two ribs and if one rib is moving a little faster than the other rib, then the muscles between the ribs go into a spasm. And often they'll present with rib pain and chest wall pain. Uh, they present with diaphragm spasms. Uh, <clears throat> this is part of their joint position sense. So they lose joint position sense. The brain doesn't know exactly where the ribs are. And so it always initiates a, an inspiration, which, not, which looks like a air hunger or a big sigh. Um, <clears throat> it's similar to the uncoordinated movements in the rest of the joints in these patients. Uh, their ribs are not coordinated. And that's one of the reasons they have this. Moving on to um, legs, this is critical. Uh, so when patients present with back pain or, or pelvic pain, uh, one of the things to look at is the feet and the ankles. Um, <clears throat> if your feet and ankles are unstable, then the knees become unstable. If the knees become unstable, which they already have unstable knees to start with uh, mostly, uh, <clears throat> so, so the knees become unstable, which then makes the hips unstable which then throws their pelvis off, which then throws their back off. So you really have an escalating issue from uh, going upwards from their feet, unstable feet and ankles. Uh, it, it's, it's like a Jenga tower. They, they are not very, they're not very stable on their legs, which then results in poor posture and increasing pain. 
how do you diagnose flat feet? It's very simple. You look at it, look at their feet from the side. That's all it is. And you can see over here, this patient over here has no arch. You can see a flat line over here. Uh, and that's the, that's the easy way to diagnose uh, flat feet. <clears throat> if you look at them from, the behind, from behind, you'll see how their ankles are turned around. And that's the result of their flat feet. They are pronated. And that puts um, abnormal pressures on their, on their ankles. <clears throat> so, you know, some of the things that we recommend is barefoot walking, where you, where you help strengthen their uh, muscles and their feet, uh, exercise strengthening their uh, lower extremity muscles, uh, footwear, um, again, sneakers, anything that has a shoe with, so if you, this is your foot, this is a shoe, you want the, you want the shoe gripping their feet. So you make sure that, the, that their shoes have laces that they tie, a cushion midsole, if they have flat feet, uh, this is the, one of the brands I, I recommend a lot. If they have flat feet, look for um, correcting their um, arches. Uh, don't overcorrect and just, just go for the gentle correction. And a lot of the sneakers nowadays have built-in arches. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of an ankle brace that I use uh, to help stabilize their ankle. Just sort of align it well. Moving up to the knees, um, you'll see that they have hypermobile kneecaps. Their patella is uh, very hypermobile. Uh, if they're lying down, you can literally slide their kneecap from side to side. So, you know, the kneecap, there, there are a group of the thigh muscles connect to the kneecap. And so when the kneecap shifts to the side, then these muscles get stretched. When the kneecap moves to the other side, then these muscles get overstretched. And so they end up by having thigh pain or muscle pain. This was, um, this is uh, kinesio taping. It's, it's a, it's, uh, I love kinesio taping for patients with uh, joint, joint hypermobility. Uh, it's, this is, I, I didn't mean to uh, go through the, I'm not gonna go through the details on this, but this is one of the studies that was done to see how kinesio taping helps patients with EDS and the, in the knee. Uh, stabilizing their knees is another issue. So this, the basic issue about this, uh, the, the basic thing about this knee brace is that it has a hinge over here that prevents them from hyperextending. One of the common causes that you might see, um, and this is again, you'll see this in CRPS, is um, patients presenting with leg pain. Oftentimes they'll have foot drop. Uh, and these patients, what happens is that there's a nerve on the side of the knee uh, when this joint dislocates, this is the knee joint, and where there's a, this joint below the knee dislocates, it actually compresses this nerve. And so they wind up having pain in their uh, leg. It's usually below the knee, from the knee to below their knee, and they'll have a foot drop. So they'll have a gait that's like, they walk like they're scraping their feet on the, on the ground, and it gets worse as they walk. Uh, a little bit on tendonitis and bursitis. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to show you why uh, patients have uh, bursitis. So this is a normal knee joint over here. And if there's a muscle or a tendon that slides over the joint, there's a little pocket of bursa over here, a little pocket of fluid over here to lubricate this uh, joint, this tendon as it slides over the joint. If they have, if their joints are not aligned for any reason, especially in EDS, if they're not aligned, then there's an abnormal pressure on this, on this pocket of, on this tendon and joint, which makes this bursa inflamed. And so they present with pain around the joint. This is very tender to touch. Uh, so the treatment, and the treatment of bursitis lies in correcting the cause of their misalignment. It's not in terms of just treating the bursa with lotions and medicines. It's about treating the cause of that. So in this case, you would want this, this joint to be better aligned. Sacral leg joint, uh, this is a pain in the, in the, in the gluteal region. Uh, it's in the lower back uh, and sometimes radiates down the back of the thigh. Rarely does it ever radiate uh, below the knee. They may also present with pain in their groin. <laughs> uh, and this is again, uh, their alignment is off. Uh, and it could be for a million different reasons. Like I said, it could be from the feet and ankles uh, not being uh, 
aligned. It could be from their knees being hyperextended, uh, just muscle spasms that can do it. So they're not aligned. When they're not aligned, then it puts an abnormal amount of pressure on this particular joint in this case. So when the weight distribution happens over here, um, more of the weight goes on this side as compared to this side. And so this patient is gonna present with more pain on the SI joint on this side. This is a brace that uh, is called the lumbar lady that we use. Uh, <clears throat> so a little bit on, on parts. Um, these patients present with, um, it's, 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 it's a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. This is the nervous system that's responsible for automatic functions in our body. It's, uh, it's very common in ADS. Uh, they present with fainting and dizziness. So they, whenever they stand from a sitting position or a lying position, they feel a little faint. They get palpitations. They have immense amount of fatigue, um, headaches. They have difficulty maintaining their body temperature. These are all automatic functions. They'll complain of uh, brain fog, and then they have this impending sense of anxiety, or they're very jumpy. Um, sometimes they'll have uh, stomach pain. Um, <clears throat> and this usually happens because they have excessive pooling of blood in their lower extremities, and so they, their nervous system is overactive in trying to maintain their pressure. So they present with a, with a constant sense of anxiety or flight or fight. Uh, this is just a little bit on, on, if you want to read a little bit more about it, it's on these websites. Uh, <clears throat> now, the problem with having dizziness is that the dizziness makes them unstable. When they become unstable, they already have unstable joints, which makes their uh, joints even more unstable, which then makes their muscles ten uh, tighten reflexly. So they're in this constant state of dizziness, instability, muscle spasms, and tightness. <clears throat> this is uh, so they off they, they they do present with anxiety and it's not it's not always because they have pain or they are not functional. It's almost a lot of it is unexplained anxiety. It's because their their nervous system, their flight or fight mechanism, is trying desperately hard to maintain their blood pressure. How do you diagnose it? It's really simple. If you check their blood pressure and their heart rate while lying down and standing up you'll see a difference of 30 beats per minute. Um, in children, if it's 120 beats uh, or 40 beats higher, um, but that's, the, that's, there's no change in the blood pressure, but their heart rate goes up. So we have them lie down for 10 minutes and then we check their blood pressure and heart rate. Then we have them stand up and you check their blood pressure and their pulse and you'll see a difference of about 30 beats per minute. In children, the criteria is 40 beats per minute. In general, uh, they, I'll also have them, if they wear a Fitbit or they wear an Apple Watch, I look at their heart rate trends on their phone and you can see that they're constantly, uh, their heart rate is always really in the high 90s, going up to the hundreds and even above that. Um, there are other tests you can do called the Q-SWET, the QSOT test and then the tilt table test. Uh, this is just an example I wanted to show you. As you can see, lying flat for five minutes, the blood pressure, and you can see the blood pressures are pretty stable from lying down to standing, uh, but the heart rate changes. So in this case, it's changed from 80 to 115, and then it drops down to 108, but it's still above greater than 30 beats per minute difference. The treatment is usually to increase their salt, increase their fluids, compression types, abdominal binder, and then there are a group of drugs called beta blockers that they can try. Um, Exercises, they can't stand and exercise. It's very difficult for them to exercise standing up. So some of the exercises that are done are actually lying down uh, or exercising in, uh, in, 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 the, in water. Um, so these are some of the YouTube uh, links for exercising and lying down exercises while you're in, in the pool. I've also included a link on uh, exercising in water with, in patients with CRPS. Um, just one quick thing I wanted to mention was hot skin is not just in EDS. It can happen in other autoimmune conditions. And so it, just keep an eye on it. Just because somebody has POTS doesn't mean that they have EDS. It can happen from other autoimmune conditions that I've mentioned over here. Um, the one other thing I just want to briefly touch on is um, called mast cell activation syndrome. 
Mast cells are cells that are found in the blood normally. They're part of the defense mechanism known as the immune system. And they, you know, the defense mechanism works only when they detect an, an enemy agent. So if I have a flu virus, my mast cells, my immune system gets active. In these patients, the mast cells are getting in, inappropriately activated. We don't know why. And they can be do simple, straightforward things like bread or food, something in the diet or something in the air that they're breathing, some mold or even just plain old uh, <clears throat> dust. Uh, they have a severe immune reaction. The simplest question you can do, uh, I ask them is, do you always feel like you have flu? And they'll, they'll tell you if they, if they, they, they feel like they have flu-like symptoms, even though it's not flu. Uh, their, their body is just producing a whole amount of histamine and cytokines. Um, not to confuse it with a condition called mastocytosis. So if you ever Google mast cell activation syndrome, um, you may come across the word mastocytosis. Mastocytosis is a whole different condition. So it's not to be confused with that. In mast cell, the number of mast cells are not increased. In mastocytosis, they're increased. Um, they present with rashes, hives, unexplained rashes, hives, itchy, they're fatigued. They just have simple, plain old simple symptoms of, of uh, flu. Uh, they are tired, everything hurts. They're, they can't control their body temperature. They have flushing after a shower. That's what a um, uh, if you rub their skin, it'll look like that. Um, it becomes red, and you can also write on it, so called dermatographism. Um, that's just a picture of a mast cell. I wanted to show you they're granular. Um, uh, some of the cells, these these are the tests I put in there in case you would like to see them. Testing is not reliable for mast cell activation syndrome because it's a condition that comes and goes, so you really have to catch it in time. Uh, these are some of the more, uh, these are biopsy tests. If somebody has a biopsy from their intestine, you can do this, this staining called the CD117 staining. Treatments are usually uh, do, do, uh, with antihistamines uh, and then mast cell stabilizers. So Zantac is an antihistamine, Claritin is an antihistamine, Zyrtec, and then um, quercetin, ketotrophin, and chromalin are mast cell stabilizers. And of course, the best thing is to avoid triggers. Uh, and then there's something called a low histamine diet that's usually very helpful. <clears throat> and then, of course, look for um, see foods uh, that can do it. Uh, dairy, um, eggs can do it. Um, and then there's meats. And then there's gluten, of course, um, the culprit in a lot of these conditions. It can be in the air. Um, <clears throat> uh, so again, managing pain is about finding what's broken and fixing that. And so that, that's one of the things that we, we have to look for. Um, <clears throat> now in EDS, uh, these patients suffer from microtrauma as well as macrotrauma. Microtrauma is when they're, uh, it's, it's more common. So it's a repetitive daily trauma, just moving, getting up and walking. These people, we all damage tissue. When we, when, just me getting up and walking down the stairs, I've already destroyed a bunch of tissue. And my body is constantly trying to repair it. The problem with EDS is that their their repair isn't as good. And that's what I want to show you. The X-ray on the left is macro trauma, but the picture on the right you can see those are micro trauma, small traumas that happen on a daily basis. Um, this is this is what I want to talk about was joint position sensor known as proprioception. So. We have sensors in our joints that tell the brain exactly where my joints are. So for example, if I need to scratch an itch on my head, my, 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 hand, my brain knows exactly where my finger is, my hands are, my elbow is, and I can scratch an itch on my head. What happens in, in, in EDS and even in CRPS is they lose this joint position sense. So they're not, the sensors in their limbs are not telling their brain exactly where they are, and so they, they don't have a good sense of position in, the, in, in this world. They lose their spatial sense. So they tend to bump into things. They're very klutzy. They drop things a lot. <clears throat> and um, again, like I said, it's physiological, um, in, in, and, but then in EDS and then chronic pain conditions, joint replacements, 
patients with CRPS, you see poor proprioception a lot. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, in my little world, what I do is um, I, I, I trick the brain. So what I do is I have them wear something that's skin tight. And so the brain uses sensors from the skin to figure out the position of the joint. And so the same principle, so I have them wear skin tight clothing or skin tight uh, gloves, or I have them exercise in water because contact with water with the skin tells, gives them a sense of their uh, joints, where their joints are. These are some of the exercises, uh, balance board, stroke standing. Um, and that's where Feldenkrais comes in over here is uh, where we, uh, that's stand up paddle board. Mm. Again, this is compression closing I wanted to show you. So this is where I was trying to show you was um, as we walk, sensors in, the, in our limbs send signals up to the spinal cord and into the brain. And then the brain in turn sends back signals down, down to the body to give us a sense of balance. Uh, this is just a repeat. So some of the exercises that we recommend for EDS is mostly muscle strengthening without stressing the joints, uh, building up proprioception. Uh, and also we, we try to encourage them with exercising with fatigue, but within limits. Uh, one of the important things is to maintain your joint movement uh, within the range of motion. So if this, so if if they can go all, we tell them not to go. So if you're if you can bring your elbow all the way up till here, we tell them to stop short. So you stop short to the extremes of your movements. Um, exercising in water is one of the best forms of um, uh, of exercise in these patients because what, contact with water gives them a sense a better sense of proprioception. We don't have them swim because that strains their shoulder joints and their neck joints. Um, a, brief, a brief touch on neuromuscular taping or kinesio taping. Uh, kinesio taping is good because the, one of the things about this is that it has a, the adhesive on this is, is in a fingerprint uh, form. So when you apply it, um, it sort of, it causes increased, it helps the body get proprioception. And so the, these patients have, have a better sense of their joints. And it mimics the superficial layer of the skin. It's designed to stretch and it can be, um, it does help patients with uh, joint issues. Um, it helps reduce swelling. And then uh, the Feldenkrais method, uh, you know more about this than I know. Uh, but again, it's a type of physiotherapy. So I had this slide for people who don't know much about physio of Melvin Christ. Um, in patients with EDS, they really don't have a good joint position sense. It helps them develop uh, and fix inefficient or strained habitual movement patterns. Um, it's, it uses slow and repetitive uses. Um, I, I just need to say, Dr. Chopra, for people that we're not actually a form of physiotherapy, even though we commonly get stated as that. So just to be careful there. Sorry, I'm going to fix that. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just want to be careful. I, I put it there because, you know, my audience don't have, 90% of my audience have not, don't know anything about Feldenkrais. And so yeah. they don't know much about it. We would so, be, it would be a little more accurate to call, for, for your purposes, probably to call us movement educators movement educators that your purposes that, that would be something they could wrap their minds around and it's yeah. not exactly true but it's close enough good so thank you thank you very much for that if you can go ahead and exit out of there so that would be uh, it's end of the show yeah mm -hmm. okay. it, it, and then you have to stop share stop share okay all right there we go. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so let's try to jump in and unpack that a little bit. And some, some things I wanna just say for our audience uh, is that, of course, Feldenkrais practitioners could be physical therapists, they could be occupational therapists, they can be music teachers, they can be someone with a business, originally I had a healthcare management business background. So we have a lot of different backgrounds. And in terms of, um, diagnosing as a Feldenkrais practitioner, none of us would be allowed to diagnose. It, that you, you may have other credentials that would allow you to be in that field. Uh, some, some states, DPT, physical therapists, now are able to um, 
diagnosis, my understanding is uh, in their doctorate level. Um, so for us, um, I've, however, I believe I have been seeing people with ADS. I don't believe I've ever had someone with chronic regional pain syndrome. Uh, however, I've been seeing people with what I believe is EDS for a number of years, and none of them have been referred to me because they um, have been told they have EDS, which, by the way, I love the fact that you indicate this is just another way of being human, and I think I, uh, relating it to male, female, or racial or, is very helpful, and that, therefore, there's just some realities to having a different, I don't know, human designation that that everybody has. Uh, right. So that, that I think that is helpful. And there's uh, obviously, at least in my experience, a lot of gradation, even in the most common form of EDS, of hypermobility, I, it looks like to me a really long gradation in which function is not much in, interfered with at all, but for some people and for other people, function and is interfered with a lot. Um, so I'm curious, I'm going to start with the EDS since that's what we just ended with, and then we'll kind of wrap back around to chronic regional pain syndrome. I'm curious about if we believe somebody might uh, be on that EDS scale, where would we refer them? Because I, I've had trouble figuring that part out. It's, so, so, Cynthia, just to bring you back to the point about diagnosing, um, I, the reason I put in the diagnosis uh, criteria was uh, was to so if somebody comes in you know there's there's a lot of misdiagnosis with these conditions and so if somebody came in and said you know look I have this pain in my leg and I don't know what it is can you help me um, in addition to doing what you do is you can say like huh it looks like you have this pain to touch and you have this terrible you know condition and it's this color change and all you know it might be um, it might be CRPS. I'm not saying it's CRPS. I think it might be. You need to go see somebody who's, uh, you know, look. Either you can look it up or talk to someone who has CRPS. But I don't. I can't. I'm not. I can't make that diagnosis um, because you are one of the. You are one of the um, <clears throat> first responders to these conditions. Um, we actually, I think, are in, as particularly in in Ellis Danlos syndrome. Uh, yes. Complications. I don't. I don't know that we are a first responder in chronic regional pain syndrome. I think we're a last responder, actually, <laughs> in that one. That, you know what? You might be right on that. I but, think we are on that one. But I. But I think in Ellers. Although I do have a colleague I, that I just met this last weekend in Ann Arbor, Michigan, whose specialty is uh, working with people using Feldenkrais in chronic regional pain syndrome and has a two year wait list because that she's developed that as her specialty. So there, wow. that's an unusual situation though for Feldenkrais practitioners. Most of us, I would say are a little bit more like generalists and people of all types are coming in through our practices. So it sounds, I mean, I don't know if all pain management doctors could be said to to really be up to date on these, uh, but, but it doesn't seem like that's the case in my area. No, it's not. Um, okay. You know, it's, I mean, in general, pain, pain medical, pain physicians do understand CRPS. The, their treatment uh, modalities vary a lot, uh, but there are not too many people who would actually um, treat or even understand or diagnose EDS. But you know, um, you're likely to be a first responder when you come to treat when it comes to diagnosing EDS. But I I know you you can't make the diagnosis, but you can raise that. We flag. can raise that, yeah. And I and yeah. that's and I have done that. I've said I you know I think right. you might be somewhere on this spectrum. I'm not allowed to diagnose. I'm just taking a educated uh, you know thought here because you you do have a lot of hypermobility and you've got. A different feel in your tissue, and you've got a lot going on that seems like it could fit. And you might want to read up about it and see who else you can find. Right, uh, exactly. and that's the best that I I can do as somebody who's not qualified and, to diagnose. And that's helping, and you know, the goal here is we're all trying to help our patients. So the goal is, uh, you know, helping somebody is by also putting them on the right track. Um, and you know. For example, that's the reason why I briefly touched on the diagnosis of EDS is a little more complex than what I said, 
But this is enough to trigger a thought like, okay, maybe you have EDS or joint hypermobility. Let's get, you know, you should get this more investigated more. And while we continue with our treatment, um, yeah, and I think one of the things that you didn't talk about, and we was you know all the belly pain and stuff that can go on with some of these people, gastric type issues as well. So there's a lot that can happen for them when when their connective tissue doesn't work right, uh, or doesn't work the way we're used to it working. Let me say it that way. Right. So from a, from a Feldenkrais perspective, and your question, you you're somebody who's been looking for options for your patients what what we call clients and you've been looking for options for your patients and as i understand it as like you you literally found a book by Moshe Feldenkrais and thought this could be helpful yes so um this was a few years ago uh, i would say about 7 6 or 7 years ago and i i was trying to figure out like you know how do i so these patients with the patients with EDS had, you know, you you can't put them into regular exercising protocols. You can't even tell them, you know, go for a walk because they just have an immense amount of pain. Their joints are not stable. They have they're fatigued. And so I was looking for something more gentler but effective. And then I came, I read, I read the story on uh, Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais's story about how he treated his own, I believe his knee pain, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so I found a book on him and I read the book and that was a, like an aha moment there. Uh, and that was six, seven years ago, I started looking for Feldenkrais practitioners, couldn't find one. Yeah. Couldn't find one. And uh, so I don't really have sort of a feedback uh, loop here. Like, okay, I send this patient to a Feldenkrais practitioner. They come back and tell me how they've done. I have very few of these. Uh, I don't know, for some reason, the East Coast doesn't have them. I, I, don't well, they, I think we're going to we'll be able to connect you after this with some people. I do desperately need people who... Yeah, who, I, think, yeah. I think we'll be able to accomplish that after this. Good. So I, I'll just go ahead. We're going to talk more about in the panel discussion with David Zemak Burson and Deborah Bose, who have way more experience in, uh, than I do. I mean... They're, they're truly the, you know, David's truly the leader, uh, a, a major leader in the Feldenkrais work. Uh, but I, I do want to say it's a few things uh, is that I do think we do, uh, you're, you're correct. We have a lot to offer people in both of these areas. Uh, in EDS, I think we have the ability to really grow the proprioceptive information to get the most out of their the proprioception that they have available. I think we have the ability to help them really begin to feel the stacking of their bones and the skeletal system and to be able to rely a little right. bit more on their bones. We can really gradiate exercise programs, even though assigning strengthening is not what we do. We can take exercise programs or areas that need to be strengthened. They can bring in their own exercises Often they bring in something from a trainer, a physical therapist that's too much for them. And then I can certainly gradiate down. That's something we're really good at. Is so break it down into smaller Much smaller bits. parts. Much smaller yeah, parts and with much different cueing. So one of the things that they need is a lot of creative cueing. And if you just give them the more global gross cueing that goes with most exercises and you can't figure out what's their thing, what do they need to hear, what do they need to track in order for that exercise to be safe for them, then they struggle. So I think we can, we can do that because that's part of what we're trained in is how do you become creative and meet each person where they're at. Right. I think we can make a difference in some of the balance and dizziness issues. Uh, both by improving posture and proprioception. But I think we also, you know, we don't have research to support this, but we believe that we uh, definitely help to bring order in the nervous system. And, uh, and we do that through the small, the slowness, the gentleness, the awareness. And this really applies to the CP, CRPS as well. That, that ordering of the nervous system, the beginning to really know your body. So for us, these things like learning to tell the difference between left and right and uh, uh, what part, what the parts of the body, that's, that's our bread and butter, really. That's what we, we 
do a lot with. And so we have, um, we don't do graded motor imagery. That's a very specific kind of work and it's in a very specific kind of highly intensive work as well. Um, and, but, but I think that we have a lot of elements that are very similar to graded motor imagery, but it's not that kind of rigid protocol. And that's the reason why I put it in there was to, for people who understand Feldenkrais, understand yeah. that, okay, graded motor imagery, Feldenkrais, if, there's a, if there is a blend in this, it, that works, you know, right, how can we modify our techniques in order to just incorporate that also. And that's the reason I put it in there. Yeah, and I think graded, graded motor imagery is not being done that much in the United States that I have seen. So it's not even like it's an, a big option for people. So they need other, people need other options. Right. It's, um, I think we can really help with this air uh, starvation, this sort air of, hunger. Yeah, that, that we do a lot with breathing and helping people to, to find um, breath in lots of different ways and to learn to breathe into different areas of the body and uh, and to exhale as well as to breathe in you have to be able to exhale so those are some things that i think we can be highly valuable in so i i think there's a lot of reason to think that we could have a positive impact packed for people in both of these groups. I don't think your idea about that is misplaced, even though we don't have high numbers of who we are out there and we don't have um, you know, research to support these two particular areas. Right. Uh, but I, I do think that we can make a big difference for, for people. Yes, I agree. I mean, and that's, what the, and that's why I sort of, in my two conditions that I picked up, I, I chose and picked up things that would would kind of relate with how you can build on Feldenkrais or add modalities like, okay, so this is what we do for the motor part of it, neuro, uh, the neuro function, neuro uh, motor function component of our conditions and how Feldenkrais can, uh, can use some of the tricks they know and borrow some of the information that we have and sort of develop a, uh, a protocol for patients. Yeah. And as, as in terms of research, <clears throat> Cynthia, there's not a whole lot of research in what we do also. It's not like, you know, people are very fast to bring up saying, oh, there's not enough research. But honestly, there's not a, research, a lot of research in a lot of things that we do. That's, true. And, that's correct. It's just that when you're in a field that's already accepted, sometimes people uh, pass over the need for research. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean you, you, you know, physicians are prescribing off-label all the time, and uh, yeah. and and some of those are good choices in the long run, and some of them aren't. So, I, I think the good news about Feldenkrais practitioners is what we do is highly non-invasive, and so I, I do think understanding these two situations. Uh, is important that that they're kind of extremes of human experiences that if mm -hmm. you understand them it's it helps you to be a better a practitioner I think if you're the person who's struggling with them if you understand them it helps you and I think also we're really great at empowering people and putting people back in charge of their lives exactly and that's a huge huge piece for people when everything feels out of your control um, to be able to feel like, hey, there's some things I can master about myself. I can know about myself. I can find some new ways to do things. That's, that's big. Exactly. Exactly. And I know you and I talked earlier about the fact that for you, some of your patients are, you know, really can't travel and are more in, have to do a lot of things lying down or have some limited in, ish options. And I, Although there isn't Feldenkrais practitioners in every city, you know, the internet has opened up the possibility of doing online sessions, which I don't think are, you know, ideal. I actually think online I had sessions no are, idea that that was even an option. I think that's that's amazing. Yeah, it's 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 yeah. a it's a possibility. And so uh, where you where people can't travel or where they can't find somebody in their area, I think there's a, a possibility that they could get a lot out of um, absolutely out of some online sessions. Absolutely. Even in the same city, even if you had a practitioner in the same city, it's hard. You know, you need a ride, you you know, find the time to go and if they can do that, 
a few sessions in the office and then have, uh, other sessions at home online. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I think uh, there's reasons for, there's always reason for people to have hope. I mean, uh, you're, you gave a class, I, I know you toned it down. You gave a very classic clinical uh, presentation, however, and that's, uh, and important that we have that kind of information, but I, I can see from the, the, your enthusiasm for helping people and our enthusiasm for helping people that there's reason for people who are struggling with these two issues uh, to have hope that there's yes. options to definitely get better. Absolutely, there are, I mean, you really have to think out of the box to help these patients and there are no, and like again, there are no great research techniques, methods, anything like that. We, you know, you just keep thinking out of the box. We have a patient, you know, how do you fix it? How do you fix the problem? And, and that's, that's, I think, what's important. Yeah, and for us, our approach is how do we help that person grow into living more fully however they want to live? So for us, it's all about, about growth. So when you think about the change in the nervous system required for uh, chronic regional pain syndrome, what we're saying is the, the nervous system has to be retrained. That's a growth issue. Uh, so we look at it from a point of view of habitual patterns, right. and help people change uh, habitual patterns so they have options. Uh, and I would say how to change ineffective habitual patterns. Yeah. I mean, we all need habits. So, uh, thank you. I really oh, absolutely. I I'll tune in on on the on the on. Is it May tenth? Uh huh. It and is. And I'll tune in that day. And we, we'll, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Great. Yeah. yeah. See, for me, for me, it's a learning experience also because you know, like I said, we, you know, I, when I. When I read about Feldenkrais, my, my knowledge of Feldenkrais is from, from the book and on the internet that I've read about it. Yeah. But I've never actually been able to send a patient to a, a Feldenkrais practitioner and get back some feedback um, as to, you know, help, didn't help, what's going on. And I think in the world of EDS, this is a huge, um, this, is, this is gold for patients with EDS. Yeah, I think it is too. And, um, and I think we can... I think we can start a feedback loop with you moving forward. That'd be great. So we'll That'll be really good. Yeah. Something out. So we'll 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 talk more after the summit is over and figure out who to attach, hook you up with, so that you can start to build Absolutely. a feedback loop with a couple of people anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to just wrap us up here officially for this session. I want to remind you that we will be back at um, noon for the final talk in this track. And then following that, we will have the panel discussion. So we're, we're down to really our last two sessions of the summit. And uh, Dr. Chopra, thank you so much for My. being willing to join us. My pleasure. And thank you for having me. Thank you. All right.